infection-related genes relative to high-status individuals. And when they see those bacterial stimuli, when they see what they think is infection by, um, by a disease-causing um, pathogen, they respond much more strongly than high-status females. We think that they're doing less good of a job controlling this response that is actually very important and very effective in controlling pathogens, but also damages our own tissues and cells. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weapon that we use against um, other invading species, but weapons can also be self-damaging. Okay. So one of the things that we've been really excited about is I told you we see these animals in two different places in the status hierarchy. And here I'm just showing you um, some evidence that there are lots of genes in the genome. There are about you know, 20,000 genes in a macaque genome. There are about 20,000 genes in our own genome. And thousands of them are directly responsive to whether an individual is high or low status. Somehow, the cells that are circulating in our blood know about um, where their owners are in, in the status hierarchy. We also recently asked, though, whether those genes also somehow still carry a signature of where those females used to be in the social hierarchy. So what was your social life a year ago, even though your social life a year ago doesn't predict where, you're at, where you are in the hierarchy now at all? And it turns out they do. We also find thousands of genes in which there's some sort of biological memory of social interactions past. And what's interesting in particular about this pattern is that the, um, the cells that remember are the cells from individuals who used to be low ranking. Cells from individuals who used to be high ranking are basically just responding to where they are now. But if these animals had a socially adverse, a socially difficult experience a year ago, they seem to carry that baggage with them into the future in ways that we actually don't understand very well yet. So our work in rhesus macaques suggests that social status is actually directly causally influencing how the immune systems of the animals we study work, including how they work when they're faced with the things that they've, been, they've evolved to deal with, which is infection by other, um, other organisms. And even when the social environment changes, there's this long-term signature of social history that carries forward um, with our animals. So um, I'm going to uh, end by talking a little bit more about the baboons, where we've taken what we've learned in the macaques. Yes? I, I just have a question. Yep. How often are you changing their social group? Not very often. This is a very hard experiment to do. It's pretty labor intensive and space intensive. Um, uh, so we um, have done this a few times now. And the way we do it is by creating those social groups, those initial social groups, right? So that is a rearrangement of sorts because we're finding, um, we're pulling these females from different um, parts of the breeding colony at Yerkes. We're putting them together. We're watching them for just about a year. And then we're doing a rearrangement, and we're watching them for about another year after that. Yeah. Isn't there some stress with just changing? Just the fact that they're on the top one year and down at the bottom the next? Yeah, I, I think they're, they're they're I think there certainly is because being in a new social environment is 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 a stressful thing to undergo. We usually don't do any biological sampling of them <laughs> until we think those hierarchies are really quite stabilized. So we don't tend to, although there's, there are interesting questions associated with that too, we usually don't sample them directly after that change. So uh, this is a, a bit of an imperfect analogy, but um, uh, one of my colleagues said, well, so it's like when, um, when kids go off to college, right? And they find themselves in an environment often with a bunch of people that they don't know before, and they're trying to figure it all out. Um, so we're not sampling during orientation week. <laughs> we're waiting until at least a semester has passed. Um, but yes, I think that's, that's, that's a great question. OK. So baboons are also very hierarchical, and we can't do those sorts of behavioral manipulations with the baboons, but we can occasionally uh, sample blood from them, which gives us the opportunity to do similar kinds of analyses, but this time in a completely natural setting where we can exclude the potential interpretation that a lot of what we're seeing in the macaques is because we're doing this really weird thing to them. 
right? This is not how they normally find um, social partners. So okay, so we go out here. Um, this is really because of the vision of one of my um, former graduate students who was looking at what we were doing in the macaques. And she said, well, I mean, I think we can do this in Ambicelli. I mean, yeah, we have no regular electrical power and uh, we live in tents, but we can find a way to make this work. And, and she did with the help of, um, of uh, some of my, I, I love field equipment that, that, um, is, uh, that adapts what we do in the labs. So what I'm showing you on the left is our centrifuge. That's how we spin samples at high speed. It's attached to a car battery, runs very well. And on the bottom, that's, a, that's an incubator, which is a very fancy, expensive piece of equipment um, if you use it in the lab. But if you use it in the field, you're actually a lot better off with an igloo cooler that has been designed to keep things at 37 degrees Celsius, which is, which is body temperature for us and for baboons. Um, that's my graduate student, Jordan, in the middle, who's um, doing some experiments to look at the presence of particular pieces of DNA. Um, he's hooking up a, a little portable machine to a solar battery outside of one of our tents. And um, over on the right are two former graduate students at Duke, Mercy Akini and um, Amanda Lea, uh, who really spearheaded this kind of work in our makeshift, makeshift um, lab tent uh, in the middle of the savanna. Uh, okay, so we've done basically the same kind of things. We've drawn blood from our animals and we know what rank they are in this population and we've asked, okay, how do those cells do when they just have food and they're just living in media for a little while and how well, how do they do after they see something that looks like a bacterial attack? And in brief, what I'll tell you is that female baboons look a lot like female macaques. So female baboons in the wild, in the savanna in Kenya, show similar sorts of rank-related patterns, similar you know, turning up of inflammation-related biological pathways as female macaques living outside of Atlanta in the United States. And so that was actually really gratifying for us because it suggests that what we're observing in these captive animals really extends to um, the real world. Um, what was very interesting to us, though, is that males don't look like that. Male baboons actually um, show relationships between social status and um, inflammatory genes um, for the same kinds of genes and pathways, but the pattern that I described to you is just directionally opposite. So it's actually high status males who seem to be turning up pro-inflammatory gene expression. And I think, you know, this is a working hypothesis, but I think the difference is that for both female macaques and female baboons, they form a social hierarchy and then it's pretty stable over time, right? And in fact, in both of these species, females normally just, they, they insert on that social status ladder right below their moms. So moms kind of help them, you know, make their way into um, the hierarchy of their social groups. Males don't do, male baboons don't do that. Male baboons do this, right? That's really different. Males leave their moms and their families when they become um, reproductively capable adults. And then, in order to get up the ladder, they have to physically compete with one another. And I think if you're doing that kind of thing, then those inflammation-related pathways that we think of in the world we live in as really problematic become something that you might want to be using because they're also fundamentally evolved to deal with things like wounding stuff like that, okay? So we're pursuing that a little bit further now, but I think overall what it tells us is, you know, that complexity that we think about in human societies also is reflected in the lives that other social mammals live. There are all these kinds of pathways that link social experience to health and to Darwinian fitness and to lifespan, and those are also profoundly influenced by early life adversity. So now, not only in the work that um, I'm doing and that my collaborators are doing, but totally independent groups are doing, we see examples of all of those kinds of arrows. And I think it is actually really exciting because it tells us about um, uh, the richness of the biology we have yet to discover. Um, 
so I just want to say that you know sometimes people talk about biology and behavior as if they're separate things. But the fact that we see a relationship between social relationships and how individuals do across tens of millions of years of evolutionary time, I think should tell us that what we observe in humans, this predictive relationship between social status, early life adversity, social interactions, and our health and survival in adulthood has these very deep evolutionary roots that originate far beyond um, the emergence of, of our species. Um, so with that, I want to thank uh, a lot of the people who were important in all of this work. Um, Jean, Susan, and Beth, who you've met already, as well as our fantastic, um, extraordinary field team in Ambicelli, um, who are out in the field with the baboons almost every day. Um, Mark, Luis, and Vass, who work with me on the CAC work, and some of the trainees who've led uh, some of the studies that I talked to you about today, Noah Snyder Mackler and Joaquin Sanz, who uh, led a lot of the Reese's Macaque work. Amanda Lea, who was the one who said, sure, we can do all that stuff in, in, in Ambicelli. Uh, Matthew Zippel, who's a graduate student of Susan's, who has been working on intergenerational consequences of early adversity. My wonderful lab group, which includes some of these folks. Um, and all the other people, you know, my social ties, my social relationships that let me do the kind of work um, that I do, uh, including my husband, who's back in that car. It says research. That's one of our vehicles in Ambicelli. And that's my kid, Kieran, who um, doesn't know that he's letting me do this, but in <laughs> fact, uh, in fact is. So if there are any questions um, about this or anything else, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, that's right. So females just go right below their moms. And, how, and so is that, is, is that uh, the same for males? No. And I, and, and I think it's because, well, I mean, I, we know it's because males don't live with their moms. Um, when they become capable of reproducing, they go find another group of baboons, and they try to um, make their way through life. Uh, in those new groups. And that's probably a strategy that's evolved to combat inbreeding. You want to mate with individuals who you aren't related to, so you have to go find groups full of individuals you're not related to. And then um, you don't have the help of a whole family to, to get you to a particular place in the social status hierarchy. You just have to fight it out with the other males who are there. So males kind of go up in the hierarchy until they reach peak condition, and that's usually the best they, they do in their lives. And then as they age, they kind of fall in the hierarchy. So it's actually really different from what happens in humans. And I think for that reason, fem the females are actually a better model for social status hierarchies in humans than the males are. Yeah, in the back? Yeah. Yeah. To a third point, but I'm still not certain as to was the, the chemical that you induced when you fed them that, and the result was that. What was that result? Yeah, so um, we see a ton of consequences of differences in social status. And in that particular experiment, what we see is okay, so if you have two tubes of blood for every individual. Say, like, take two tubes of blood for each of you, and one tube is just like blood. And the other tube is blood that's been challenged with this bacterial molecule, right? The, the biggest effect we see is, was the blood challenged with the bacterial molecule, right? Which is good, right? It's good for our cells to go, OK, I should do something about this right now. So there are massive changes in how genes in the genome um, are, are regulated, whether they produce a lot of product or a little product, just because of that bacterial effect. But then what we see is that how much genes respond 
So the difference between a tube from you that didn't see anything and a tube from you that saw that bacterial um, challenge is much bigger for females who are low in the status hierarchy than for females who are high in the status hierarchy. And I didn't really mention this, but you know, those sorts of inflammation-related processes are really um, strongly implicated in a lot of um, chronic disease in humans, including cardiovascular disease in particular. And so inflammation is this thing that constantly comes up when we talk about um, uh, ways that our bodies can respond that have disease implications. So what we're seeing in, in, the, um, in the rhesus macaques is consistent with the fact, with the idea that, um, that social status modifies, you know, that sort of inflammatory potential. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yes? What about social networks? So we, yeah. this, this, in public health, we have this idea of Mm -hmm. also has some negative consequences. Yep. So what, would, what is your view on that? How does it 